Hi, everyone. This is Heath from the Music Technology Teacher Network, www.mutechteachernet.com. I hope that you, like me, have spent some time this summer to recharge, to relax, hopefully get to do a little vacation time um, as we get ready to enter the new school year. And I hate to bring up bad news, but summer is almost over. And the thing about it is, for me, that's not bad news. I've enjoyed my summer. It's been wonderful, but I'm always excited about starting the new school year. And as we get ready to go back into the new school year, our thoughts begin to turn to what we're going to do in our classrooms this year. Maybe reflecting on the last year. What worked? What didn't work? Are there new things or new ideas that I could try? So in that spirit, I wanted to share some uh, ideas that I've come up with that I think could be really effective and engaging for your students. And I think you probably maybe really would enjoy teaching it too. So here it is. Me, like many people all around the world, have been totally like binge washing and just like crushing hard on Stranger Things season four. Now, I've got to be really careful with YouTube and uh, all of the uh, uh, algorithms that they're using to pick up on uh, copyright violations and that sort of thing. But uh, I think I figured out a way, hopefully, to get around some of that stuff. But some of it, too, you're going to have to do your own research. But if you haven't checked out Stranger Things, I would highly recommend it. Uh, if you haven't seen any of it, go back and start with season one. Go all the way through season four. Um, it's only available through Netflix. But if you're like me... I am a child of the 80s. I was born in the early 70s. So the time frame for Stranger Things is set in the early mid 1980s, which is like right in my wheelhouse. I am definitely a child of the 80s. And the thing about Stranger Things and the soundtrack and the music of Stranger Things is that it is just rich in content that you can use in a music technology classroom. And it's something that you relate to um, but your students are going to relate to also. Um, it's very popular, uh, particularly among uh, teenage teenage folks. Uh, so a lot of your students will be familiar with Stranger Things, which I think is going to make it really relatable. And again, there's some really great content that you can use and pull into your classroom as the basis of lessons as you go into the uh, upcoming school year. So let's take a look at a few things. So I'm pulling all these ideas just from the Netflix series, Stranger Things. And really, I, I'm thinking about this and I'm thinking, you know, I can actually do an entire class just based on Stranger Things, but I'm getting a little ahead of myself. So again, with YouTube and not wanting to violate any of their policies is sort of kind of tricky. So hopefully this will work. So from here on out, I'm just going to refer to this as uh, Stranger Stuff. How about that? I think that'll be good. Okay, so let's talk about Stranger Stuff and how you might use this in the classroom. One of the things about this show is you bring the 80s into contemporary culture. The music of the day, the music from back in the 80s. And the thing about str the soundtrack, The Stranger, Stranger Stuff, is that it's so rich in content. Some of the topics that you could teach from using uh, resources from Stranger Stuff is synthesis, remixing, sound effects, soundtracks, arranging, music theory, and much, much more. So let's just take a look at a few things that I think could be really effective in your classroom. So let's start with synthesis. Anyone that's maybe seen any of my earlier videos knows that uh, the summer, that's one of my areas that I've really kind of dug into is synthesis. The thing about music from the 1980s, pop music particularly, like it is the age of synthesizers when we get into the 1980s. So you can talk about people like Roger Lynn, who was an early electronic um, and digital instrument inventor. Uh, and Roger Lynn is still alive and very much inventing and uh, innovating still today. But Roger Lynn in the 1970s was the first person that developed um, an electronic and digital instrument that actually used samples, uh, real instrument samples, in the sequencer that he developed, the Lindrum. But we'll talk about that in a little bit, too. The one thing that you'll notice missing from the things we're going to talk about is Bob Moog. And Bob Moog is literally the person we have to thank for inventing the synthesizer, starting way back in the 1950s into the 1960s. 
Correct. But when we get into the 1980s, we don't really see a lot of uh, songs that are using Bob Moog's instruments, but there's a reason why. If you go back into the 1960s when Bob Moog develops his early synthesizer, he establishes a company in his name. Uh, and as companies grow, you know, you get a board of directors. And so now he, as the person to establish it, is basically a member of the board. So when you listen to music from the 1970s, you see lots of Bob Moog's instruments used in 70s music. But as we move into the late 70s, there begins to be a rift between Bob Moog and the company that he establishes. So in 1977, Bob Moog actually leaves his company, his Moog Instruments company, and moves to North Carolina where he becomes a professor at the University of North Carolina, Asheville. So Moog leaves his company in the late 70s. Now, the other thing that begins to happen in the late 70s is you have all these other companies that begin to develop their own versions of synthesizers that Bob Moog started with. And so as these companies develop new instruments into the late 70s and early 80s, they're actually developing instruments that are less expensive, and more portable than some of the Moog instruments. So by the time you get into the 80s, you don't see a lot of Moog instruments used in 80s pop music, but keep in mind that Bob Moog leaves his company in the 1970s, and eventually the company is going to fold. Now, by the late 90s, early 2000s, Moog is able to actually reattain the rights to his own name. But in the meantime, just an explanation of why we're not going to see a lot of Bob Moog's instruments used in the 1980s. So first of all, Kyle Dixon and Michael Stein are the two guys that composed all of the original music for the Stranger Things series. Now, if you've ever heard the theme uh, from Stranger Things, it's very familiar and it has a very distinct sound. And one of the things that makes it distinct is throughout the soundtrack, Kyle Dixon and Michael Stein are using a synthesizer called the Prophet 5 and a Roland synthesizer called the SH2, which is actually one of the early versions of Roland synthesizers. You hear this all the way through the Stranger Stuff soundtracks. And one of the things that gives it that 80s feel is because they're using these two synthesizers, uh, and particularly the Prophet 5 that was used, widely used uh, in pop music across the 80s. Another part of the soundtrack, Kate Bush. If you haven't heard all of the news uh, this summer about Kate Bush, who was a alt music, not really mainstream artists from the 1980s that she had a track running up that hill that was used very prominently in season four of Stranger Stuff. And it actually pushed her song running up that hill back onto the Billboard Top 100 here in the year 2022 uh, from a song that was made like 40 years ago, which is really pretty interesting. But two instruments that she uses extensively is one called the Fairlight uh, CMI that you see there on the left, which that's just an instrument contained within itself. This was before the personal computer actually came out. So you have this instrument that looks like a piano keyboard, but underneath you basically have the brains of the instrument. It's like a hard drive and then a monitor and a QWERTY keyboard on top of it, which is pretty cumbersome, but one of the early uh, iterations of a more mobile uh, synthesizer. On the right, you have the Lin drums developed by Roger Lin, one of the early sequencers that actually used real uh, samples from real instruments. Um, between the Lin drum and the Roland TR-808 is probably the two most used drum machines and sequencers um, you know, throughout the 1970s, 80s, and even up until today. So those are two instruments you can focus on with Kate Bush's song. Another track, Ray Parker Jr., Ghostbusters. I think this is season two when the kids all dress up like Ghostbusters and go trick-or-treating for Halloween. But everyone knows that Ghostbusters, da 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 that synthy sound. Well, Ray Parker on the track Ghostbusters uses the Korg Poly 61. And this synthesizer in the 1980s would be considered like a consumer synthesizer, the Korg Poly synth. But nevertheless, Poly 61 and those sounds from the tune Ghostbusters, we know that today. It really crosses generations. Another tune that we can take a look at, David Bowie Heroes. Now, the thing about this track is that the David Bowie version isn't the one that's actually used in the series. It's a remix or rearrangement that we're actually going to talk about later, but uh, it could be used uh, in a discussion to share something called the EMS Synthy Suitcase, which was a synthesizer that was used back in the 70s, and it was called a suitcase because, well, it looks like a suitcase, but you pop it open, and on the inside, you get this, and so that's a pretty radical uh, looking instrument 
thinking in the 1970s, you're walking into a jam session and you walk in with a briefcase that opens up to become this mobile synthesizer. So David Bowie Heroes, yeah, that's another one, the EMI Synthy Suitcase. Dead or Alive, you might not remember the band, but almost everyone has heard at some point their song, You Spin Me Right Round, Baby, Right Round, like a record, right? right? Dead or Alive on that tune uh, and others on that album use the Len 9000, which actually is incorporating now the idea of digital drums along with MIDI keyboard. You see it on the label there, just below 9,000 MIDI keyboard recorder. So this is when uh, these instrument companies have developed this MIDI language platform that all these instruments can communicate with the personal computer. So the Lin 9000. Michael Jackson Thriller, probably one of the most anticipated and successful albums ever recorded and probably one of the most influential albums ever recorded when it comes to influencing uh, pop music of the 80s, 90s, 2000s, and beyond. And certainly because the video that they made for Thriller would take music from being strictly an aural or a listening experience into the age of the music video, where now songs are going to be written and right along with it, you have that idea of developing the music video. And Thriller was, I think, the thing that sort of changed all of that about how people approach music. But if you look at the Thriller album, uh, some of the instruments that are used throughout that album, the Roland TR-808, which is what I think is probably the most influential uh, digital instrument ever developed. If you look at the Roland 808 along the bottom, you'll see there's 16 keys. Uh, there's red, orange, yellow, white. And each color represents a beat. So you have four different colors. You've got four beats. So basically what you're looking at with this machine is one bar of music. And when you go to look at today's modern DAWs and dolls, if you go into the piano roll, this is still how, this is how today's modern dolls are designed. This idea that one bar of music, you're going to have 16 columns and that when you're entering MIDI data, um, say in step entry method, uh, the way that you're entering the data in today's modern dolls is really the way that you entered data and patterns into this Roland 808 with the 16 buttons across the bottom of the device. But that's another discussion for another day. Just to say that Thriller uses the Roland 808 throughout that album is a super important instrument to cover with students in music technology courses. The other instrument that's used throughout the Thriller album is a synthesizer called the Jupiter 8. And you can look and see, uh, you know, the control knobs and sliders. Uh, you notice as part of the Roland, you have these colored buttons that they use on the 808 that they're also incorporating into the Jupiter. Now, the thing about Roland and the Jupiter line of instruments, you could have a discussion with students about how these instruments develop. It's kind of like buying a car. And as cars go from one model year to another, you know, they make updates and make improvements. So if you look at this uh, line of Roland synthesizers, you have the Jupiter 8, but before that you had the Jupiter 6. And you can see the Jupiter 8 was a little more uh, complicated. But after the Jupiter 8, Roland developed the Jupiter X. Ah, aha, marketing team. I see what you did there. The X as a Roman numeral 10. So the uh, Jupiter X synthesizer um, for that redesign. And uh, Roland would continue uh, developing the, the Jupiter line of synths before eventually they'll uh, abandon that and move on to other kinds of synthesizers that they're developing. But, you know, before the Jupiter 8, you had the Jupiter 6. And before the Jupiter 6, there was actually the Jupiter 4 um, synthesizer that was developed by Roland. This is one of the first uh, commercially available synthesizers that Roland put out. Now, if you're wondering, is there a Jupiter 2 by Roland? Well, no. But if you don't believe me, just Google it. Jupiter 2, and what you're going to find is the spaceship from the 1960s uh, series Lost in Space. So there's your Jupiter 2. Uh, but it is not a synthesizer. That's going to be the end of part one. I hope that you'll continue and view part two, where I'm going to discuss how you can use songs in the soundtrack from Stranger Stuff for you to design units around original composition, but also arranging and remixing. Uh, I'd really appreciate it if you would hit that subscribe button. If you find these videos useful, please share this with your colleagues. Uh, tell them to check it out. And always, you're welcome to visit the website, www.mutechteachernet.com. Advocate, support, inspire, and create.